Good morning, everyone. I've got Rosemary Cameron with me as well, who's the psychiatric CNC with me at Port Macquarie. Um, so we'll, we'll share the talk a little bit. Um, I have been working at Port Macquarie for quite some years. I also work at Armadale and Wagga through RDN. So um, very, very passionate about psychiatrics in regional areas and rural areas. So, sorry. I'll just tell you about the context. So Port Macquarie, everyone thinks about the beaches. Um, they are one part of it, but we also go right into kind of the, the kind of furthest parts of the um, area. Um, one of the pictures there is a lady taking us for a long walk to find a husband. We didn't find him, we didn't know how long we'd walk for um, on that path. Um, so it, it's just quite a varied, varied geographically in Port Macquarie. Um, so I'll let Rosemary talk about this. So Mid North Coast Local Health District covers from Coffs Harbour down to Passion Fruit Creek, um, just near Johns River. So we do the southern end. So our service covers from um, up near Stewart's Point, I guess Yungai Rail, down to Dumbogan on the water, across to Passion Fruit Creek. We cover Combine and Elands in the hinterland. Um, it's quite a big area, as you can you can see, um, covering you know seven thousand odd kilometres, which is quite significant. Our colleagues in Coffs Harbour, we do have contact with them, and we do actually share ideas and experiences. Um, so the current population is 110,289 people. It's the second largest prevalence of dementia in New South Wales. Um, it's one of the dementia hotspots, so we've got 97% more than projected cases of dementia than in 2018, so we reached our target. Um, one of our geriatricians a number of years ago when he was employed each year has talked about the tsunami of dementia. We're there, we're thick in it. So it's, it's really, um, it's got its challenges too because we are a regional area and we travel a lot of kilometres. Um, so our older persons mental health services, we work in with our colleagues as well. So we're very fortunate, you know, to have the RDN funded clinics and we've got some New South Wales health funded clinics. So all up we have um, four clinics in the area a month, which might sound like a lot, but it's actually not. Our older persons mental health colleagues have one clinic. They alternate between Kempsey and the Port Macquarie regions, which isn't a lot either. So they have bi-monthly contact. So we triage um, our clinic days and we often can't set the clinic days, sometimes till the day before because we end up with people in hospital, people that won't let us in, um, new urgent referrals. Our mental health colleagues will often ring and say, look, we've got one of our clients in a nursing home that's wreaking merry havoc, lots of problems with behaviour, distressed. So we bump one of ours off to put one of theirs on. So we do actually work in an integrated way together even though we're separate services and we need to because it makes it work. Um, as I said, we've got one day of our um, psychogeriatric funded clinic for, for us from RDN and we have two others from um, state funding and the one for older persons mental health. We've got two nurses, as myself and my colleague, um, and we work pretty constantly. And as I said, if we need um, to do visits and one of us, obviously there's always leave period, so we're off on leave or sick leave, we'll just grab anyone we can find, like another nurse or allied health worker to come out with us and they're pretty flexible because we're under a larger umbrella of aged care services and we have um, multidisciplinary teams so we get very resourceful with who we'll grab to come out with us. So I guess some people don't quite know what psychogeriatrics actually is. Um, it is old age psychiatry. The service is geared towards patients with dementia and other complexity. So we see quite complex patients um, and that's just across the board in, in um, a lot of the aged care teams in psychogeriatrics. Um, our patients have multiple comorbidities, multiple problems. So dementia underlies a lot of the difficulties or undiagnosed dementia or undiagnosed intellectual disability. We see that in older patients in regional rural areas. Um, patients have quite significant behavioural disturbances. Um, we have issues, as with everyone else, service provision to these patients. 
getting aged care services is really difficult. Um, the safety and risks posed by the situation can be quite acute, um, and we, we respond to that. Um, our patients still drive, and some of them shouldn't be, and drive without a licence, so we have to deal with that. A um, lot of family conflict, um, drug and al alcohol issues, particularly alcohol issues we see in our elderly patients. Um, when we turn up the, to the home, we can see what's going on. Um, we see people who are at risk of homelessness being kicked out because of their behaviours. Um, even from caravan parks, we get that quite a lot. People about to be evicted with nowhere else to go, no money. Um, elder abuse is a, an increasing problem. It's increasingly recognised. We see a lot of it. And, and it's really complicated to deal with. Um, and obviously psychiatric illness, that's, that's what our core work is. Um, and other things like hoarding and squalor, we, we are the ones who deal with that or look at that. Um, and certainly isolation in general. A lot of our patients are very isolated, particularly in this region. I'll, I'll mention it later as well. Um, people like to retire to Port the Port Macquarie region or they're halfway between families from <laughs> Sydney and Brisbane. So they go to Port Macquarie. I'm not sure why, <laughs> I guess the weather. <laughs> um, so that's, that's our patients, and most of our patients will have multiple issues. Um, these are the referrals we get. So one week I had all these letters saying, I'm at wit's end, um, and people who haven't seen doctors for years, and I mean decades, because people actively avoid doctors. Um, we've been told by <laughs> services that you'll need debriefing after you see this person. Um, we're always the last resort, people will say, and no one else will go in because of safety issues. Um, so, you know, often with squalor. Um, actually, so. one, we ran into a house actually just recently, just related. Um, and from the outside, it was on a 90 acre property, and these couple were living in two separate houses. They looked intact from the outside, lovely old country houses. It was deceiving because it was only the walls. When you went inside, there were big gaps in the floor, the whole back end of the house was gone on one of the houses and so it's a risk for us because we never know what we're going mm. into and, mm. and, and, I'm, and I'm not a twiggy so I'm walking <laughs> along this floor, there were like floorboards sort of falling through and it was a bit concerning. Mm. So, so we do have to be very careful basically um, <laughs> on these visits because we do all home visits. Um, so as I said, most of our patients don't have a GP, a lot of our patients don't have a GP. Um, we've had referrals from people just kind of well-meaning people, so people who stopped by to ask about a house for sale and saw someone inside was worried, so we get that call. Um, we get referrals from police, from the bank, someone coming in with someone who they're worried about taking financial advantage of them. Um, the shops, we have patients who might shoplift because of their dementia. Um, and certainly hospital referrals, it might not be a concern while in hospital, but someone's just a bit worried about this patient. So we'll, we'll have a look at what's going on, because the home visits are what tells you what's going on. Um, our patients, from a psychiatry point of view, pose a lot of risks. Um, this is one example of squalor. Um, the lady that this particular lady had actually been seen in a clinic and presents fairly well in a clinic. She was, uh, she, the social worker on, with the service was asked to see her at home um, just to help her with some bills. It was in severe squalor, her home. Um, quite, quite marked. Um, we had to get past all these wasps all this overgrowth to get into the house. Um, she had huge debts. She had no idea um, how much she really owed. She was already being caught for dri um, driving without a licence. Um, her fridge was full of spoiled food and she was delusional. And this is what you can't see in a clinic. She's done really well. So she's really well now. Um, but and it didn't. It just took a little bit of time to get all, everything kind of worked out. But that's the kind of patient we will get. Um, with elder abuse, as I said, there's increasing awareness of elder abuse. All types of elder abuse we, we've seen. Um, people, money, unfortunately, is, is a big factor. So people revoking wills, power of attorneys, guardianship orders. People being kidnapped by someone who's not meant to have, um, you know, be, be involved with them. We see that quite infrequently. Not infrequently. Uh, every now and then. Um, so we've had to take out guardianship um, applications and involve police. Um, BPSD, so behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia, is another aspect of my work. Um, so we, have, we had a patient who was throwing fire extinguishers at a facility at people, really acutely agitated, um, and now he's singing to DVDs. So that's, that's how, you know, with management, with managing his medications, um, helping the staff, that's what happens. Um, 
Yes, quite different staff reaction the first time we went and the second time. Two visits. Um, but it is really just coordinating and sorting out what needs to be done. We've had to review our service um, because we haven't had more, more um, funding for more staff and we are getting... Our wait lists were huge. Um, we just couldn't get to every patient in a timely manner and people are very unwell um, who are referred to us. We also worry about staff burnout because it's not an easy role. Um, the population's growing in Port Macquarie. There are a lot of facilities being built as well. Um, aged care facilities, what they call ageing... Well, ageing in place facilities, but also lots of resorts, over 55 resort type places as well. Um, and the complexities are increasing as well. Also, the changes to the aged care system are making it a bit more difficult. People are staying at home, not getting the services in a timely manner. And, and the scrutiny. So we get, we're getting more referrals now because people are worried about the scrutiny. And in, in this area, certain things that are specific in terms of needs are that um, people are very isolated from previous networks. So as I said, moving away from family. Um, there are areas where there's a lot of social disadvantage. Um, and the Aboriginal communities are largely, well in Kempsey, there's, there's a large community there. Um, and some people are just very isolated, as Rosemary spoke about, that, the couple that were there. Things like transport, you know, people going to see a doctor, it, it, it's not possible. There are no public transport networks um, in a lot of places, even close to town. So um, getting to see a doctor really isn't on the priority list or getting things attended to. So I might get Rosemary to talk about the, the, infant, the data we've just collected. So, so we've probably spent the last two years looking at, well, all right, we know we've got complexities, we know we're getting far more referrals than what we can actually manage in a two-person team with our doctors that fly in and out. So we thought, well, we've got to be able to evidence it. So we started collecting data all over the place and Dr Ho's very much into data, so it's been sort of prodding and poking us for a couple of years <laughs> and coming up with suggestions and sort of... Um, but it's been actually quite good. It's validating. It sort of has really indicated to us the level of complexity, the numbers of people, even the amount of kilometres that we do. So um, we know in 2018 we had 27 clinic days and a total of um, 2,856 kilometres for um, one of our clinics. So we'll divide it up. We've got our two doctors that come in, Dr Ho and Dr Sabo. Um, and then we had the you know, 1,100 kilometres and 60 consultations um, from the other doctors. So on average it was 106 kilometres a clinic day and that can vary. And the other variable thing that we have problems with are the flights. So often flights may be cancelled or they may not get in till midday. Dr Ho usually stays overnight, so we've got a little bit of capacity to make up and we'll often be seeing people at 7 o'clock at night. So um, the flexibility is still there. But unfortunately, the one-day clinics are a problem when we don't get a doctor till 12 and we have to have them back at the airport by 4.30 and that would be a problem shared, I guess, across all the regional areas. Um, so... We had 34.71% increase in referrals January to October 2018 compared to the same period in 2017. We've looked at the data, I guess, over the last three years and we're going in the upward direction um, and constant. Um, we had an increase of 54.8 referrals from the aged care facilities January to October 2018 compared to the year before. And we've noticed this year already, given um, the scrutiny that Dr Ho's just talked about, that we're going to actually have a huge increase because we, we're already, we already know um, that we've had a lot more referrals because of what's happened with the Royal Commission and facilities being quite concerned about PRN medication and behaviours and just managing those better, which is a good thing. Um, so the consults, um, we had difficulty with our follow-up consults because we have a, a huge increase in our new consultations in 2018 compared to 17, so 51 to 114. Um, we weren't getting to our follow-up, so we're finding that they were blowing out to, to six months at, at stages and our follow-ups are quite important, particularly when new medications are commenced and there's been behaviours. Um, and also we were also um, seeing more people in the hospitals because of need to support um, applications to the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal for Guardianship or financial management. So that then changed 
our figures and ability to get to the follow-ups, but because we've made a lot of changes to our service and our um, rigorous data collection has actually helped us to implement some of those changes, we're now able to get to the follow-ups. So we've had an increase of 27% of follow-ups um, this year compared to, to last year. We've had fewer hospital contacts and I think it's because we've had um, a new psychogeriatric nurse practitioner at Kempsey that's just increased her days from coming back from maternity leave and she's been around, I think, now for three years. So our positions actually also cover the hospitals. So we cover all the aged care facilities in the area. We cover the community and we cover um, two hospitals. Um, Port Macquarie Base Hospital we don't go to. There's a nurse practitioner and other positions there, but we do cover Kempsey and Warhope hospitals. Um, so, yeah, that, that does affect our um, service flow. The clinic consults, as I said, we've um, we've now not had as many into the hospitals. Our follow-ups, we've had 128.57 increase. So we've now gone from six-month wait for follow-up back to probably, um, you know, on, t on time. So there's no wait time now for follow-up. We're getting to those, whether it be month or three months depending on the requirement of the treatment um, strategy or plan put in place. So we're pretty happy with that outcome. As I said, the new um, consults are still on the increase, but we're able to get to those in a more timely manner because of just some efficiencies made, which Dr Ho will talk about shortly. Guardianship applications, we had 19. Now, keeping in mind that any application to for guardianship or financial management is last resort. So we certainly try not to do it. And where we can encourage families or next of kin or whoever might be sorting the, um, supporting the person to do it, we do. So these were just applications that we actually did as a service, which is considerable because there's a bit of work involved, but also you're taking away someone's um, choice and disempowering them. So we don't want to do that, but because of the safety aspects, we need to. Um, and we had seven in 2017. Um, the hospital visits, we go in to see them and write a report and review for the purposes of a report for guardianship. There's no psychogeriatricians or psychiatrists, old, old age psychiatrists that cover the hospitals, so we're in as well. So Dr Ho and Dr Sabo are the psychiatrists we use for that. In relation to the applications, that's 19 that we applied for, so we support a number of other applications at any time. So we support families to do it and it might require a lot of education. It's a very stressful thing for, for families to be doing. Um, where a family, where there's going to be fragmentation of relationships, we don't want to actually do that, that we might then do it if it's too difficult for the child of the parent or whoever it might be. We don't want to actually burn all their bridges in relation to the relationship with them, so we might then take that over. But we do have a lot of applications that we're supporting at any time as well. So essentially with all these, with changes and developing the service, and also the ideas that we generate, or maybe I generate, um, we're really fortunate the manager's really flexible. Um, so I, and she did volunteer me for this talk. So Darrell, um, who's been our manager, and, and Colleen as well, have been really um, supportive of what we do. Because um, it is not an easy job, it needs to be fairly flexible. Um, so what we've done um, in the course of kind of this time of probably a year or two years is really define the roles much more clearly of, of, of the service um, and collaborating a lot more with other clinicians around to support them. Um, it's been quite marked, the change. Um, and it's really recommended to any team. Um, we formed a really integrated service where a few people, we've got a social worker who's with the aged care team. She was a sole clinician. Um, and, and her work was very difficult, um, you know, with these some of the very difficult clients. So she is co-located now with um, Rosemary and our um, other RN, Chris. And admin also have some dedicated time to assist us. So all that's actually improved efficiency markedly. Um, it's also improved morale, and, and that's a big thing, the culture um, in the team. Um, we've also addressed home visit safety because it is getting less safe, we find. The visits are very different to when I first started many years ago. Um, it has to be two-person visits. Um, if not, we've had three-person visits just because of, we don't know who's in the house. Um, our patients are par can be paranoid about theft, 
particularly in dementia, you know, something's missing, you've stolen it. We had someone thinking we were stealing their vehicle the other day when we were getting into our car. Um, so it, it, we have to be very mindful. Um, so we've, got a, we've now got a designated car, a four-wheel drive, because we are going on properties. Um, we've got kits, squalor kit. I mean, we have to have a well-stocked first aid kit because we turn up and see people in all states and we don't know what we'll find. Yeah, and I guess just in relation to that, in normal community health services, we have um, home risk assessments that we are mandated to complete. But the problems with our service is that none of our clients consent to our visits. So we have to just turn up and we never know what's there, which is why it's really handy for two-person visit. And our social worker, who'd been working in isolation for a number of years, was just turning up on her own. So we identified that that was considerable risk. Mm -hmm. And obviously just checking where we are at the end of the day, someone designated to make sure you've returned. Um, and addressing burnout. So flexible work practices um, for the nurses, which has worked really well, um, where there's coverage all the time. Um, the regular integrated team meetings, um, changing work practices, as, as I said, has been, has been quite marked um, in, in improving morale. So quarantine time for research or people's interests um, to keep your to keep your motivation up really important um, and education educational activities making sure people do attend um, conferences or forums um, and just giving people some some new tasks or new ideas or new things to run with even admin really enjoyed it we've been networking more so we've spoken at the older person's mental health service where we'll share some coverage the nurse practitioners and even power care so as I said. The benefits of morale and improved sense of well-being amongst um, the staff makes a big difference um, in how the team runs. Um, we're also more efficient, I think, and we've done a lot of quality improvement projects and it's still going. We've got this running list now on the whiteboard in the room. We've also been able to take on more students because of this. Um, regular performance reviews are now occurring all the time, regular audit, activity, audit activities, clinical reviews. And as Rosemary said, the wait times have improved. Um, and we've been predicting service needs. So we've been doing things, um, for example, mapping the services locally. Um, and this has been very effective for management, actually. These are some of the team comments. I won't read them. But essentially, people feel safer. People feel happier. People feel they're more able to have be, uh, spend time at work doing things to complement the clinical work because we're so focused as frontline clinicians on seeing all the patients that sometimes we just need a bit of a break and we don't want people to burn out. It it really does make a difference. Um, and having a shared workload, particularly with the guardianship applications, for example, if you are the person identified as the applicant, it can be very, very um, dangerous because um, people get very, very upset about them. But having a shared um, kind of applicant makes it makes a difference, um, and and we do a lot of laughing because <laughs> it's a hard, it's a hard job. On um, some days it's very tiring, um, and I think that that makes the team work really well. When we all get you know get along really well. Um, one thing that hasn't been successful I'll mention is telehealth because our patients are not insightful, um, and. So it makes it less likely that they'll attend any clinics. We have tried it with a very experienced psychiatrician who was in the role before me, um, but we just couldn't manage it. People couldn't travel. Also, because we see very agitated patients are travelling, even short distances is an issue. Um, and people get very confused about technology. It's re and hearing impairment, sight impairment. Um, with telehealth has been difficult trying to get um, a good picture. And also, I need to see the environment the person lives in to, to develop strategies or work out treatment. Um, so we've developed some ways to measure some data, um, especially with complexity, because it's hard to capture complexity. And we've designed templates for this, looking at different aspects of it. These are just some of the ways we're doing that. Um, and I guess things that we're going to address are really, we, um, Rosemary and Chris do wear uniforms in the community. It can be a trigger for agitation for some of our patients. Um, we've had people say that. So we have to keep looking at ways to, to, to um, discuss that with management. Um, duress alarms as well when we're out, even with two people. Um, and trying to use EMR on the road is really hard. I don't know if people are successful. I find it very difficult. Also, there's no signal, um, even for our phones sometimes. And we're trying to get a dementia kit together to take out to facilities, because um, I do a lot of behavioural work, so strategies are really important. Um, and people, it's, it's hard to sh tell people, but it's important to show people, so we're trying to get that put together. 
and essentially just for the future, more education, providing education to people around. Um, we do that a lot already, but you know, having more time to do that is is good. Um, and trying to have a, developing the team would be ideal, but that does depend on funding. So we, that's why this data collection is occurring more and more so. Um, and that's it. So thank you for listening.